This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. The summer is always a great time to cast the rod and reel to fish Mississippi's waters. Just about every corner of the state has a place to enjoy this great summer activity. So today we'll talk with Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks about where to fish and what's biting this time of year. Dr. Major is ready to take your pet questions. Libby always likes to hear about your latest encounters with nature. So join our conversation this morning with your phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. If you ever miss Creature Comforts on Thursdays, it repeats Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning, Libby. Hope you're doing well this morning. Good morning, yes. Um, what do you have for us today? Okay. One thing, I guess, after that great rain that I had yesterday, I don't know how many people had it where they were, but that was... Uh, we've been waiting for chanterelle mushrooms to come up and have found very few, so we were really pleased to have that rain. I think it rejuvenated everybody, and the birds were happy this morning. Uh, insects are out everywhere, and if you're an insect watcher like I am, lots of neat things to see, moths at night. I've got a, um, a white, my house is painted white under the porches, and the uh, porch light attracts a lot of uh, wonderful moths every night, and I thought maybe I should mention that to people. That's a great place to go and just see what moths you have haunting around your place. And um, tufted tit mice fledged at our house this week, and uh, that's a great little bird to watch. Um, I've, I've noticed that some people get disappointed. Tufted tit mice about the same size as the bluebird, and they like a bluebird house real well. And I know that some people that are hoping to attract bluebirds get disappointed when the tufted tit mice <laughs> takes up residence. But I think they're every bit is is cool a little bird and a lot of fun to watch so i think we just have to kind of take what we get but my tough to tip mice uh the fledglings were out and it, it looks like an annoyance but i'm sure this is how it goes when you've got there were three they ba- well they're not you know it's hard to call them babies anymore juveniles jumping around driving the parents crazy while they're trying to feed and uh the kids are sitting over there on the branch just squawking 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 and so the the daddy very patiently daddy and mom both were taking um sunflower seeds over to feed them and putting them in their mouth and it was like so and they come over here and get your own but uh, they persisted in just staying on the branch and being fed and a touch of tip mice usually leave the feeder anyway they'll pick up a seed and go over to a close tree and put it down and knock on it and you know crack the shell and then eat whatever they want to eat and sometimes they'll kind of hide it in the bark of trees and I noticed that the babies were all sitting in the same tree where the tufted tip mice usually kind of stash extra seed so they they were learning the feeding routine real well but again that's a good bird you might want to look up and watch for and gray and green tree frogs and um, I hope you have them on your porch. If you want them, I've, I enjoy them. But um, I'm pleased that they're not too close to my head in the bed at night because they can be they can be obnoxious at 2 a.m. as my <laughs> husband says. So um, he has earplugs by the bed just in case he needs them. If the tree fly, tree frogs are are um, making a very loud noise, I, they've got some places where they can get on our porch. It creates an echo. Mm. And so anyway, that's kind of what's going on at my house, and I imagine at everybody's. Lots of caterpillars turning into butterflies. Um, this is a good time to get out your um, guidebooks and start figuring out what you've got in your yard. So um, I recently uh, visited my friends out in uh, Palm Springs, California. Uh, we ended up the visit by going to San Diego. So me as a big zoo person, obviously, uh, the San Diego Zoo, I got to go there. So that was on my, my zoo bucket list. 
It's an amazing zoo. I mean, that thing is it's just a huge, huge zoo, and they do a really a great job uh, with, uh, you know, giving the animals kind of a natural habitat to roam around in. <clears throat> we got there, uh, I think, in just enough time, although it was funny. When we got there, there's a tour that you can take on a bus. So we're going through the bus, and every time we would stop somewhere, <laughs> the guy invariably would say, you might want to come back here a bit later this afternoon when the animals will be a little bit more active. Uh, so anyway, we saw them, and, and sure enough, the, as we were leaving later that afternoon, uh, the animals were quite a bit more active. But, uh, you know, for, for a zoo, that's one of the risks you take sometimes is that the animals, you know, um, they need to get out of the heat and such uh, every once in a while. So uh, we were lucky, though, and got to see most of it. But again, great zoo. Uh, would it, would it, uh, uh, recommend it for anybody who's a big zoo fan. Um, and um, I remember the California condors there yes. had an incredible um, setting, and it's the only time I've ever really gotten good close-up looks at them. I can't remember if it was. I think that was what I got a good picture of, of one of the birds of prey actually eating some carrion. I guess it was. Oh, or I'm, I'm sure it was good. supplied too. I saw too. some of your pictures online. I'm gonna have to look at some more. Yeah, yeah. and so, the giraffes. Oh, the, the giraffes are, were just. Incredible, almost too friendly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the giraffe has always been my favorite animal since when I was a kid, for whatever reason. Uh, so that's that. You know, that's my way to judge whether a zoo is any good or not. If it's got giraffes, it gets my thumbs up. So, um, what about the fireflies? So have they pretty much moved out of oh, the okay. area? Okay, and they should be um, synchronous fireflies. Should be blinking around Oxford, and Waldoxy ought to be having a good show now. I haven't heard from anybody much this week, although I got a um, a, a letter from a guy in Alabama. His letter was forwarded onto mine, or email. I always call emails letters now, I guess. But, <laughs> yeah, he got an email from a, a, a guy in Alabama that has discovered them, too. So I think we've got a f- several sightings now from Alabama, some of which came from radio listeners that um, uh, they've got every bit as many as we do. So for our Alabama listeners, North Mississippi may be lighting up with synchronous fireflies, but there's still plenty of time to see everything else. We had uh, uh, all kinds of treetop flashers last night and what we call heebie-jeebies or what Lynn actually named them heebie-jeebies and they they kind of dart around and they flash almost as fast as the synchronous fireflies and they're up higher so they're still out right now and um and then the common fireflies are out at um dusk still about I guess maybe that's a little later now seven thirty, eight 8 o'clock you can see them all around you also went to uh, the the event there behind the um, uh, craft center on in uh, Ridgeland, and I think I like the the the, the treetop. I mean, I like the sinks. Don't get me sure, wrong; that's but cool. Yeah. But I did like the the treetop ones as well. So. Yeah, they're so bright. Yeah, that's... Uh, Java. I believe uh, you uh, saw a Cooper's hawk. Or tell us your story. Well, yeah, I just wanted to mention a um, uh, good friend, Eddie Wright. He's been on Deep South Diner a couple times uh, with Eddie Wright. Uh, barbecue. Hey, he posted some pictures on Facebook about how he had at least about three Cooper's Hawks. Well, we nobody knew what they were at the time. Libby and a couple other um, bird uh, people uh, noticed that they were Cooper's Hawks, but they were just on a, along his fence line, like three just perched. And he has small dogs and um, and things at his house. And he was just like, I need some help. I don't know what to do. Should I pop him with the pellet gun? Or is that is that illegal? I thought that was kind of interesting with all, all those kind of questions yeah. that were popping up on his uh, on his Facebook feed. But it was just something to see as far as just in the neighbor residential neighborhood, you have these like birds of prey and and it was three of them just like on his fence and he said they were there for a while it's like they weren't just you know some birds will kind of fly away when you clap at them or something like they were sitting and perched so i i tagged libby on it to see what she would say and she you know like like i said identified them as uh young young cooper's hawks yeah i think it they were probably siblings from a nest is what yeah. I'm guessing, that they were all right there together. And they may have been waiting for their mom and dad to <laughs> pop some food in their mouth. And I actually was that kind of um, unusual just, you know, in a residential area to see those kind of kind of birds just kind of hanging out pretty much. Often that's where they'll be. They, You know, and they even eat pigeons and they'll eat doves. So anything that's in the backyard. But they are they are 
birds hunting other birds primarily. Yeah. So the, and I don't think the dogs would have anything to fear from them because they're they're for one thing they're a small hawk and they're zeroed in on a good bird snack. Yeah, that's a honest. lot of yeah. a lot of the comments too, where it's because he he has a couple yeah. dogs, but one that's like a smaller dog, and they were like, "Oh, he's gonna get your dog." <laughs> yeah, I noticed there was a lot of that fear. Yeah. Yeah. And Troy might want to address that further too. Uh, so, good morning, Doctor Major. How are things going at the clinic? Uh, I hadn't made it there yet. I okay. Flat tire, so <laughs> Uh-oh. That's the re- reason I'm late, okay? All right. <laughs> but anyway, I- I'm headed to the clinic now. So you got your, your tire repaired. You're back on your way. Yes, yes. It's always something, okay? <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. You know, back to the Hawks, I agree with Libby. They were probably waiting on a meal from their parents. But uh, there's some larger Hawks that certainly could possibly uh, damage, even if they didn't take it off, their the talons are so sharp. If they tried to take off a, a very small small dog, it could be an issue. These were probably harmless, I would say. All right. By the way, now's a time for me to mention, uh, always big thanks to Libby and Dr. Major. They've been doing this show since the beginning, which is, gosh, I don't even want to think about how long we've been doing this show. Over 10 years, I think. Yeah, it's uh, about 15, I think. I have, I have a few pictures from the past. I'm going to pull up and show you guys. I, I've been holding these pictures, I guess, right for this moment. <laughs> I know we have an age. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> but the fact that Dr. Major, despite having a flat tire, is still willing to come on the air with us. Dr. Major, we certainly appreciate what you do for us each week, and Libby as well. Uh, the show wouldn't be the same without the both of you, so we do certainly appreciate uh, what you do for us. It is time for our first break of the hour. When we get back, we'll be talking about fishing with our guest, Dennis Rickey, fisheries biologist at the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Dr. Major, ready to help with your pet questions? Libby likes to hear about brushes and encounters with nature. Got a full line of, of phone calls ready to go as well, so stay tuned. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. Today we're talking fishing around the state with our guest, Dennis Rickey, from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. If you want to join the conversation with a question or comment, you can call us at one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Email animals at mpbonline.org. We've got some phone lines to get to, so let's start in Natchez. Francis is first up. Good morning, Francis. You're on the air. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm an average... Uh, <clears throat> uh, I love the bass fish, and uh, I've been wondering this ever since I started. How come largemouth bass are down south and uh, largemouth bass are up north, but you never see any smallmouth bass down south? And uh, it's not because of the depth of the water, because we've got 80... 60 foot uh, areas around here where the water is 60 to 80 foot deep. And my next question is, what can you do about these horse flies? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tackle the uh, the largemouth bass and smallmouth bass question. I don't know about the horse flies. <laughs> um, smallmouth bass have an affinity or preference for rock. And so therefore, the and cooler water so therefore the only good place to fish for them in mississippi is northeast mississippi pickwick up around that area in our, in our streams we have spotted bass okay and spotted bass can also be found in in lakes and in reservoirs but so that's why you don't see smallmouth bass all over mississippi you'll just find them in the, in the northeast if you want to fish for them All right, Francis, thanks for calling in this morning. Let's uh, stay on the phone lines. Next, our friend Roger, who calls in from Florence. Good morning, Roger. Well, I'm back on a different subject. I'm sorry, but the birds, 
I've uh, been watching some birds and a bird feeder, which is one of those that you stick on a window, and then you can look from the inside, and birds come to it. And one of the birds that comes to it is, has been identified by a friend as a brown-headed cowbird, and I'd never seen one before. Oh, they're really, yes. <laughs> they're sort of attractive. Uh, well, they're sort of ugly, too, but <laughs> The cowbird, and, and I've heard about cowbirds and used to think I saw them, but these I've looked at closely. So that's interesting. Another thing is, though, if you get up anywhere near the window, they see you through the window. So my question is, what can you do to put maybe a piece, I don't know how you get a piece of one-way glass, but you see them on television when they're interviewing criminals, but... <laughs> but could, what can you put up there on the window on the inside so you can get right up close and look at them and they can't see you? You know what? Um, there might be a way to camouflage like that, but um, you could try some of that camouflage that turkey hunters use where it looks like little strips of camouflage material and you could peek through it. But I, I tell you, an easier way that I know works for people, and I've kind of done it too, is just to get them acclimated to people being in there. If they get used to you being fairly close to the glass and then they'll do it. You can even put, you know, a toy or a mannequin or any kind of uh, doll or something close to the window so they get used to seeing those eyes there. And uh, I've heard people use a picture out of a book or something like that. It's just so they get used to there being something in there. And try not to have a lot of movement. If you're if you're sitting there watching and they come to eat, if the, the stiller you are, the better luck you'll have watching them through those. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Roger, thanks for the call. Next, we'll go to Yazoo City. Christy's called in today. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. My name is Christy from Yazoo City, and I have a two-year-old Rhode Island Red that's sick. Her comb is bent over, and she waddles like a duck, and her tummy is real full. And I was, I gave her, I was recommended to give her a soaking bath for 30 minutes in Epsom salt water, warm water. And that didn't help very much, and I was wondering if you had a suggestion to what to do next. You know, that's real, a real issue, trying to figure out what to do in this case. Uh, is she passing feces? She has, yes. And she's, her poop is real runny, and uh, it's, it's, she's not real clean right now. Okay. Because of her poop. Uh, has she been laying eggs? Up until, up until now, yes. She does not, con- I, I, I only can say convulse, but move like she's trying to lay an egg. And after I gave her the bath, I put ivermectin under her wings and under her butt. That was recommended. And she's not be- any better. I, I'm actually worried about her being possibly egg-bound, uh, which, which can't happen even in a larger bird. We see it in uh, small uh, birds like cockatiels, that sort of thing, but it's possible. If you have a veterinarian that can look at her, I'd say get her in, let, let them look at her and see what see what might be done. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't sound very good, and I'm sorry, but um, without seeing her, I don't know that I can do anything else, okay? All right, sir. Thank you. All right, Christy, thanks for that. better advice. Back, back to horse flies. Okay. <laughs> there is very much a problem this time of year. Old timers have told me, and I've kind of watched it, and to a certain extent I think it is true, they tend to disappear after the first full moon in June. So be on the watch out for that. And that's, again, I don't know any scientific fact, but again, things that people see it think about a certain night. All right. you know, I'm interpreting that to mean probably the, their season is mostly the first half of June, huh? 
Let's hope that's yeah. true because I noticed that you, you do have them really bad for a while and then they do tend to leave. I'm going to watch for that too. Yeah. All right. See what date in June. Uh, very good. I think it's uh, we. Our guest is here. That's why I lost my place here for just a minute. Our guest is Dennis Ricky, uh, and Dennis, thanks for being back on the program with us. In the past, you've talked about things like invasive carp and giant salvinia. Are there any new dangers taking over our waters that we need to be concerned about? Let me think now. We've got. Um, Island apple snails uh, on the coast, and uh, they've been in Hideaway Lake and another lake uh, around Picayune, but they're in uh, oh, a sewage treatment lagoon, things like that. And they're escapes from aquariums, uh, or, or you know, people get tired of them. And it's a big snail, it's a land snail, but uh, it uh, lays a pink uh, egg mass. Uh, climbs out of the water and lays a pink egg mass. And so um, it's prohibited in Mississippi because it can do severe damage in rice fields. So um, sometimes you see them for sale online. But that's about um, the only aquatic species that I know of right now. Um, Any updates on either the carp or the salvinia? Well, I think we have successfully gotten rid of uh, giant salvinia at uh, Ross Barnett through a variety of techniques and just diligent effort and a lot of surveying uh, the carp. We still have research programs going on, and we have a um, um, reimbursement program for our processors, and we may go to do some other things to try to remove them. But it's, um, you know, I don't. As abundant as they are, and in an open system like the Mississippi River System and the Yazoo River System, all you can do is try to just limit the damage. There's no way that we're ever going to adequately get rid of them without a big concerted effort. You know, if somebody comes along and has a nice product for them, and Americans start eating them, and and you know, everybody is the next. It's the newest tilapia, let's say. Uh, uh, we could put a dent in them, you know. So we're just in the prevention to try to keep from them from spreading to new waters, which we're, uh, we're Mississippi is working with other states in the Tennessee Town Big Bigby Waterway, where you have locks and dam structures. It's a it's a very narrow area where you could use um, light, sound, bubbles, electricity, all those things to deter them. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think we're going to have to come up with a fancier sounding name so that when they, um, you know, get served in restaurants, people will think they're getting some sort of gourmet type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so well, let's turn our attention to good things found in waters. Uh, where are the fish biting this time of year in Mississippi? Well, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I, I tell people that the best reports that we have are the, uh, the state, uh, the weekly fishing reports which are on our website and uh, you can talk to your friends and you can look at Facebook and but we get um, reports uh, on some lakes we have to have a reliable report on a regular basis uh, and we publish those uh, each week on the website from um, second week of February to into November and uh you know, typically they'll say, you know, it's fishing in the early morning, later evening, or um, in in deeper lakes off of points, things like that, where there's there's cooler water. Um, so I would just refer people to, to those. It, it's on uh, under our website under fishing and boating, and it's uh, fishing reports. And then we have what we we, we translate um, the the. The sampling information that biologists collect when they when they do creel surveys and when they do netting or if they do mostly electrofishing, okay, um, we put that in non-technical terms that people can understand in terms of catch rate per hour, what percent of fish over a certain length or over you know a certain weight, and what do people prefer to fish for here, you know, and then. Um, you know, whether that population of that particular fish is on the increase, is on the decrease, is it getting, 
you know, bigger? Is it getting heavier, you know, or is it uh, overcrowded? And so that type of thing. And it's, those are called real, R-E-E-L, facts. And there's a wealth of information there. If you want to know what we sample the lake for and what we found, that's where it is. All right. We're visiting today on Creature Comforts with our guest, Dennis Rickey. We're talking about fish, but also looking for any kind of uh, wildlife questions that you have and observations and also pet questions for Dr. Major. By the way, the next full moon in June is June 14th. So hopefully uh, after that, the horse flies will dissipate. We won't have to worry about those uh, too much anymore. Hey, if you want to join our conversation this morning, the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. You can always send an email as well. Send it to animals at mpbonline.org. We'll be back with more after this. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing a doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. You're listening to an encore presentation on MPB Think Radio. We're not able to take your call right now, but you can always reach us through email. The address is animals at mpbonline.org. This is Mississippi Public Broadcasting, Think Radio. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hotfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. We're visiting today with our guest, Dennis Rickey. He is fisheries biologist from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Join our conversation this morning with your phone call. The number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Let's go back to the phone lines and say good morning to Rebecca, called in from Gulfport today. Good morning, Rebecca. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning, I, I was listening to MPB, of course, on the way to pick up a customer the other day, and bird songs came on, and I finally heard the whistle for the bird that so obnoxiously calls at 2 o'clock in the morning in my backyard, <laughs> and it is a Chuck Will's widow. Oh, oh you know, I, I hate to say this, but you are so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I... I really miss. We used to have Chuck Wills with us. They they are declining in numbers all over their range, as far as we know. And uh, they like a habitat kind of a grown up feel. But it's been a discussion about Chuck Wills widows not uh, being around. So I'd love to have your Chuck Wills widows. That's all I can say. <laughs> I'm sorry that they, if they wake you up, but yeah, they're they're, just, they're, they're very loud. They're very, very loud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and where do you live? <laughs> um, I live in Gulfport, just just the north side of the interstate, but we have eight acres, and, and the majority of that is natural woodland, and we keep it that way. And you've got some open area. Yeah, well, that open is area. one of your rewards, so I'm, I'm sorry if it wasn't the reward that you wanted. But, um, no, it, but I also, I also want to tell you, I had I, we got red-tailed hawks out here, uh-huh. and I was coming up my driveway one day, and one flew over the front of my car and had a poor little black kitten in its claws. So yeah. we do not let my dog out of the house without being on a leash. <laughs> All right, Re- Rebecca, I agree with you. I think the earlier it is, the louder the bird chirps. So uh, hopefully that they won't be uh, too much of a, a hassle for you. And we appreciate you uh, calling us this morning on Creature Comforts. Let's uh, stay on the phone lines. Next, we'll go to Al, who's called in this morning. Go ahead, Al. You're on the air with us. Hey, good morning. Uh, I have a, a question for your guest there. I love to fly fish for brim and small bass, but... Uh, you know, I'm kind of limited on availability uh, to a couple of farm ponds and, you know, public parks and that kind of thing. And I was wondering, uh, is there a way I could I could get um, a list of some of those, uh, like, national forest lakes um, in and around North Mississippi? Like, you know, I know there's a couple in uh, Benton County and Marshall County, but... You know, I was just I was just looking for other ideas on places where I could find 
find some big brim, uh, I tend to wet wade or fish from the bank, uh, and, you know, instead of using a boat. So I was just going to try to get some ideas for that. Yeah. Um, I've got a, I've got an email at my office that, uh, covers all the, um, U.S. Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, water bodies in the state with, um, uh, the names and and the permits that you need to go fish there and you know the fees things like that so if we get your your phone number and your email i will uh be happy to send it to you um i've got uh two colleagues that are fly fishermen so uh i'll consult with them and uh we'll get you some recommendations mostly they fish in uh in streams you know they go to streams and, and fly fish Okay. All right, Al, uh, thanks for the call. What we'll do is we will put you on hold, and if you would tell our call screener your email address, we'll give that to Dennis, and hopefully Dennis can get that uh, information out to you. So uh, thanks for calling. We'll go ahead and put you back on hold. All right, uh, let's stay on the phone lines. Next, we'll go to James, who's called in from Hendersonville, Tennessee, this morning. Go ahead, James. You're on the air with us. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is James. I have a – I thought it was a Cooper's – hawk um, couple that actually laid uh, made a nest in the tree in front of my house but I just seen it try to get a rabbit just this second and I think it was a red tail hawk because it has a red tail on the top part but all I seen was the bottom part and it looks all brown but it tried to get a rabbit just now right in front of me I thought it was amazing I thought it was going to get him but he didn't the question is that was the coolest thing I've seen it like all week anyway um, so the question is about how long from the time the the hawk lays the egg to the time that they start to fly. Because the other day I was sitting here on my porch and I seen the baby. There's only one baby there, and his head. He was pulling meat, uh, strings of meat from uh, whatever he was eating from. That the mother just uh, dropped off. So about how long from the time that they are the, the eggs are laid to the time they start flying away? Because I have no no idea. It's probably yeah. been a couple of months we've been watching it. Yeah, and most birds are about a month. A small bird will be you know, a couple of weeks as an egg and a couple of weeks as a nestling. There are a few things, some of the small warblers, that really speed that up. But a hawk, yeah, I bet you're right, six weeks, eight weeks, right about in there from okay. the time she lays the eggs until they're going to be flying around couple months okay, to be cool. right on track and i'll bet that was a red tail that was after the rabbit yeah because it was, it was just the it was the couple because that's the only two that we see in the yard i mean anywhere around here um and yep. it was amazing because we we thought it was a cooper's uh, cooper's hawk because everything was brown underneath but on top as soon as it came down to get that rabbit it was the coolest thing i, I know i've said that before but as soon as it came down, I seen the red tail thing, and ooh, that's not a cooper. That's not a cooper hawk. It's a red tail hawk. You know, we had a show. Yeah. A couple, yeah, we had a show a couple of weeks ago about falconers, and that's the the kind of excitement that they talk about when they hunt with those hawks. All right, James. You know, I love life. I love life, and I love uh, all the animals. But we all need to eat, and yeah. so do they. Yeah. So this part of life, our part yeah. of the circle. That's the only thing they can eat. Really, they've got to eat meat. All right, James, we appreciate your calling in this morning. Uh, this is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio, visiting today with Dennis Rickey, a fisheries biologist with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Uh, Dennis, remind us, who needs a fishing license? Okay. Um, anyone 16 years and old, old and over, needs a fishing license, a statewide fishing license. Unless you're going to fish in a private pond and you're a resident. Um, residents who are 65 and older are exempt. Non-residents are not exempt. So a non-resident of any age uh, from 16 up has to have a, a license. Um, some people who are 100% disabled are exempt from a license purchased, and then they just need to prove their disability in their their state of residency. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, people who are 65, if they don't want to uh, 
uh, prove their age or if they're disabled and they, and they don't want to carry around all that stuff, that they can buy a voluntary $5 license, and that will help the agency because they, they are then a licensed uh, angler or hunter. And so we, we can uh, count them uh, towards uh, our federal aid allotment, federal funds allotment. And I do want to say this, uh, that if, if you're a crappie fisherman, or even if you've never crappie fished, we have world-class crappie fisheries in our northern reservoirs, Grenada, Enid, Sardis, Arkabutla. We have people from every state coming to fish there in the springtime when they're spawning. People wait for two or three hours to get to launch their boat that's how good it is and that's how popular it is it's a good eating fish and so if if you you want to catch a big crappie if you just want to have the thrill of of catching decent sized crappie and it's a great eating fish just just go uh i would recommend that you go sometime in the fall maybe mid-september to maybe november the first when the crappie come in closer to the shoreline uh, springtime is really crowded. If you if you want to try to get the spring spawn, you better make your reservations about a year in advance wow. <laughs> and uh, be prepared to wait. So uh, just it's one of the little gems we have in Mississippi that I think is underappreciated, and, and I want to encourage Mississippians to, to take part of it. All right. It has been a busy day on the phone lines this morning, so let's uh, go back to the phones, and we'll start with Rachel in Eupora. Thanks for calling, Rachel. You're on the air. Go ahead. Hey, um, I grew up, that uh, recording you just played of the bird, I grew up uh, calling that bird, our family called it a whippoorwill. When you break it down, I think it's the same bird. It's, when you, yeah, it's a relative. It's a very similar. Whippoorwill, yeah. And it's very similar to a chuckwill's I widow. Think. Yes. And I guess that's why they, they kind of... Name given the common name, it's Whippoorwill and Chuck Wills Widow. Yes, and they do Chuck sound Will's very similar. Widow. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Whippoorwills, I think um, you're going to find them in greater numbers f- a little further north than you would the Chuck Wills Widow if you look on the map in um, the bird book. Uh huh. So are Whippoorwills also in decline? Yes, there there are fewer of them. I think any of those, it's kind of a prairie sort of a bird. Um, you know, all bobwhite quails, how how rare are they now? People don't hear uh-huh. them very often. Yeah. And those uh, the chuck wheels, what are the lady that, that called in before you was uh, along the coast? And I've noticed, I've seen uh, reports of, um, of uh, bobwhite quail along the same area that she is. And it's a pretty much the same habitat. Uh-huh. Well, thank you so much for clearing that up. Yes. Thanks for the call, Rachel. Let's stay on the phone lines. Next, we've got uh, Leonard, who's calling in from Tennessee this morning. Go ahead, Leonard. You're on the air with us. Hey, good morning. Yeah, I had a comment about the whippoorwill, and uh, we call them poor wills widow. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. But uh, one is the northern version, and the other mm-hmm. is the southern version, and one summer i didn't have an air conditioner inside the window open and they they call all night and yeah uh, there was one of each outside my window and it was like the civil war the north against the south one kept saying whip for will and the other kept saying poor will widow and they argued all night <laughs> yeah yeah looking on the map we have both in mississippi but um the um, the uh, whippoorwill is going to be more prevalent in the northern parts of the state. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm just just the, about two miles north of the Mississippi line in Tennessee. Yeah. But they argued all night. <laughs> <laughs> whippoorwill, no, poorwill's widow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Leonard. Thanks for Great. calling in this morning and listening to MPB Think Radio. We have come to the time for another break. When we get back, we'll talk more about where to fish and where families can do some camping in some state parks. Dennis Rickey is here from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Dr. Major still on the line, ready for your pet questions. You can join the conversation this morning with the phone call. The number is 1-877-MPB-RING. Our phone number is 1-877-MPB-RING. 
672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. We'll wrap the show up after this last break. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Each week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest for the day is Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Still a little bit of time left to join our conversation with a question or comment at one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can always email animals at mpbonline.org. Uh, so, Dennis, I think there is an effort made to make um, fishing accessible to all Mississippians. So if you would tell us a little bit about uh, handicap accessibility at some of the lakes. So at our state fishing lakes and our state park lakes, there's there's uh, 20 state fishing lakes and 25 state park lakes located around the state. And uh, we have handicap accessible fishing piers. And the restrooms are handicap accessible too. So someone who's handicapped could go in there, use the restroom facilities, take a shower, um, fish off of a fishing pier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, And I think now we've got a pet question for Dr. Major coming from Beckett in Poplarville. Go ahead. You're on the air with us. Hey, good morning. I uh, have a little dog. He's a 15 year old dog. And uh, I'd say a week or two ago, he choked on a tree. We were able to, uh, the tree that he, uh, he seemed fine, but over the weekend, he started having trouble keeping food down. And uh, we brought him to the vet Monday morning, and they did all kinds of tests and scans and whatnot, and they said they thought he had some sort of infection. And uh, I was just wondering, could that be like maybe it scratched his throat when he got stuck, when it, when it got stuck? Like, even soft food, he's having a real hard time keeping down at all. You know, that's something that happens fairly frequently where they get something hung in their throat, and certainly it can scratch or irritate it. Uh, so that probably went ahead and put him on some kind of medication, I imagine. Uh, right. I would suspect antibi- antibiotic would be in order. And sometimes a little steroid might, might help as well. It's hard to say without checking, but yes, it does happen. And of course, his age doesn't help either. I mean, he's what, 15, 15, you said. So. Uh, roughly, we, adopt, we adopted him a few years ago. They were a little fuzzy on his age. Right. This would be one thing I would follow your uh, best lead on. Sounds like you're doing the right things, and soft food would be in order as well. But good luck with him, and I sure hope he does okay. Right, right. I was just checking my theory. I appreciate y'all. Y'all have a good day. All right, Beckett, thanks for the call. Um, <clears throat> so, Dennis, I, I love the state parks in Mississippi. I've been to a number of them in the in the central Mississippi area, or at least tried to visit them both for uh, hiking. And uh, a friend of mine and I at uh, Clarko State Park uh, rented a cabin a couple of uh, years ago. So tell us about the state parks. And I guess it's anywhere from, if you want to go out there, primitive camping, I think they call it with a tent and everything, up to cabins. Tell us what some of what our parks have to offer. They have... Um 18 of them have lakes that you can you can fish on. Two of them have hotel type facilities. That's Roosevelt and I think JP Coleman. Um, there's a boat dock and boat rental up in the northeast at JP Coleman or Tishomingo. There's a canoe trail at Tishomingo. Mm-hmm. There's disc golf. There's primitive camping. Uh, with just water provided. There's uh, uh, camper pads you can pull into with water and electricity provided. There's cabins, rustic cabins, um, some built by the uh, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, Some of them have dining facilities. Uh, 
there's some golf courses. Uh, I mean, our outdoor digest is just a grid of, of, of things you can do. But what you can expect to find, and, and at State Fishing Lakes, too, is a nice, clean, safe area that's uh, well-maintained uh, for you to use. Yeah. And um, we have uh, – there's permit fees to, to engage in activities there, whether it's boat launching, fishing, camping, Pavilion rental is another thing that you could do uh, for a reunion or a big, you know, family cookout. Um, and if you you think you're going to be a frequent visitor to state parks and state fishing lakes, you can buy an annual pass, which will allow you to go to to those 44 facilities uh, throughout the year. There's annual bank fishing passes, and there's um, uh, boat launching passes. We offer 30-day camping at some facilities. Yeah, I get my park pass every year, and it, it pays for itself for sure. Yeah, and I'll say the um, my friend and I did a number of the trails uh, when during the pandemic. We both thought it was a good way to avoid going stir crazy was to get out in nature. Uh, and I'll say that the trails are are fairly well marked on most of them. Although I remember it. Um, Paul B. Johnson down there in Hattiesburg, we were out there on a trail, and it's one of those where you're going along, and it was getting a little more grown up or whatever, and I thought, I don't know if we made the right turn, but suddenly we found a park bench or something out there and realized we were on the right tra- uh, track. So uh, if you enjoy hiking, I would certainly uh, recommend the state parks because I say the trails out there uh, are, are fairly well marked. <clears throat> We've got our friend Mikey from Mobile on the line, and she's up next. Good morning, Mikey. Good morning. I'll try to be quick because it has been a big, big nature thing. It's all been coming to me. (laughs) Um, First of all, my friend Surprise, which is the um, local, we've known each other for years, a local corn snake, rat snake, whatever, um, uh, and uh, usually comes out and watches while I do some mowing, which I have a non-motorized mower. And I was worried about him or her because I hadn't seen him since the last time I'd mowed the yard. And I, I don't know, I had some kind of something that bugged me for about five weeks. So that's been a while. But the other day I went out and around one of them, it's like it had done it on purpose. Right around the base of one of my urn flower pots, it left a full snake shed. It's just gorgeous. And it's about three and a half or four feet long. Um, so I was very lucky to be able to collect that. But um, the owls, <laughs> I didn't even know I had owls. I knew that they were here. I've heard them before. But apparently there's been a nest of about three of them that has hatched, and they're just now fledging um, because I've been watching them for about five days now. <laughs> and they are hilarious, and they are so far fearless also. Um, are they and are, are they branching? What I call branching, where they're just spread out around the close to the nest, but sitting out on the branches. I love. Oh to see no, them. no, no! They, 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 they're sw- they're flying, huh? Well, I thought it was a hawk at first. One mm-hmm. of the, one of the red tails that, that I've also <laughs> known in this neighborhood for a long time. But uh, you know, but I went, boy, that was really because it was right outside my window, like six feet away. <laughs> And I thought, boy, that was really silent, even for a hawk, you know, that flight. And so I watched, and then the next day it came back at about the same time, which is about this time of day. Mikey, we're going to have to hold you there. Sorry that we ran out of time. Always good to hear from you, though, and thanks for the update about what's going on in and around your area. Creature Comforts is a product of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio. Funding is provided in part by listeners. To hear today's show or previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show is produced by Jabba Chapman, and our call screener today was Charles, our intern. For Libby Hartfield, Dr. Troy Major, and our guest, Dennis Rickey, I'm Kevin Farrell. Stay tuned because up next, it's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio.